An American flag, backlit by the afternoon sun, slowly flaps in the air. The camera pans back to view the Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial on the English Channel in northern France. An elderly man approaches the cemetery and walks around the rows of gravestones, which are largely marble crosses with the occasional Star of David indicating the burial of a Jewish soldier. His spouse is with him, along with their three teenage grandchildren and his daughter and her spouse. He searches the crosses and comes to a halt at a certain one, where he falls on his knees and sobs. His family approaches him and attempts to console him. The camera steadily zooms in on his face, eventually pausing at an extreme close-up of his eyes. Omaha Beach, June 6, 1944, Doug Green Sector American Ranger soldiers are traveling in landing vehicles to Omaha Beach over the rough English Channel. Upon landing, one unit's captain, John H. Miller, orders his troops to clear the murder holes and inspect their guns for sand and water as soon as they get out of the boats. Miller's right hand shakes nervously. Several troops are hit by machine gun fire from German bunkers made of concrete and machine gun nests carved into the cliffs above the beach as soon as the landing ramp in front of the boat opens. Other guys jump into the surf and over the landing boat scuttles to escape the machine gun fire. Some are struck by enemy fire underwater, while others drown from the weight of their bulky equipment. Many seek shelter behind the wooden landing craft obstacles and the thin flanks of the steel tank obstacles that block access to the beach after reaching the beach. But these areas provide no protection against mortar rounds and incoming fire. A mortar shell explodes close by as Miller climbs up the dunes. The blast temporarily stuns him and removes his helmet. Miller's hearing becomes muffled and dulled as a result of his shock. He observes as soldiers all around him are either too terrified to move or are getting hit by gunshots or mortar bombs. A private asks Miller what to do, looking him in the eye. As his hearing slowly returns, Miller gives the order to his sergeant, Mike Horvath, to lead his men away from the enemy's fire and along the beach. Miller is dragging an injured man as he stumbles up the shore. Miller finds out abruptly that he has been carrying less than half of the man's severed remains when the man is killed by a mortar fire. Despite the attempts of medics to treat them, many of the injured are eviscerated or missing limbs and slowly bleed to death on the beach as a result of the German onslaught, which kills the majority of U.S. Army personnel and leaves twice as many wounded. The remaining members of Miller's squad gather at a sandbar offering minimal protection from the German artillery. In order for his forces to advance behind the sandbar, Miller gives the order to clear away the mines and barbed wire using Bangalore explosives. A machine gun nest perched on a nearby cliff prevents the guys from continuing until they reach the closest concrete bunker. Miller sends some of his troops into the firing zone, where they are instantly killed, and then orders Private Daniel Jackson, his sniper, to charge into the fire zone and killed the guys in the machine gun nest with two accurate rounds. After Jackson's efforts become effective, Miller pushes his soldiers behind the bunker where a soldier brandishing a flamethrower ignites it. One soldier on the beach orders the others to let the German soldiers jump out of the bunker and burn to death. Miller's men immediately clear a path out of Omaha for the remainder of the battalion by engaging other German forces in combat in the trenches behind the bunker. Miller also witnesses a few individuals ruthlessly murder a few German and Czech soldiers who are about to surrender. Private Stanley Mellish receives a Hitler Youth knife from Private Adrian Caparzo, a friend of his. Mellish bursts into tears. Horvath fills his haversack with cans labeled Italy and Africa in addition to a pinch of soil he's collected in a little metal can labeled France. Miller is informed by Horvath that the beach has quite a view, thousands of American soldiers dead and injured bodies are scattered across it. One of them had the name S. Ryan on his backpack. In the United States, Rows of secretaries are drafting death notices to be sent to the relatives of those lost in various conflicts across the globe at the War Department. While typing, one of the women finds three letters meant for three different males in the same household. The three men are brothers from the Iowan Ryan family, and all three letters will be sent simultaneously to their mother. Mrs. Ryan's youngest and fourth son, James Francis, is serving in the 101st Airborne Division and is believed to have dropped into Normandy prior to the beach assault. The letters are brought to the attention of General George Marshall, who instructs his officers to locate James and have him brought home right away after reading an emotional letter sent by Abraham Lincoln to a family experiencing similar hardships during the Civil War. Three days after D-Day, back in Normandy, Miller meets with his commanding officer to report on a challenging mission that claimed many of his men's lives. Miller receives fresh orders from Lt. Col. Anderson, which include leading a team into Normandy in search of Private James Francis Ryan and returning him. 
after assembling as many men as he can. Miller finds Corporal Timothy E. Upham in the press box of the camp to act as a translation for the squad. Upham, who is proficient in German and French, takes over for his previous interpreter. The group departs towards the rural areas of France. Upham attempts to speak with Mellish and Caparzo, but despite his superior rank, he finds them unpleasant and even offensive as the new guy in the group. Erwin Wade, the squad medic, questions Upham about his upcoming book about the camaraderie among soldiers. The mission is called into doubt by hot-headed Brooklynian Private Richard Ryben, who wonders if the men's lives lost searching for Ryan are worth their sacrifice in larger conflicts to free Europe and France. Though he realizes that his current orders are more vital, Miller, who is also dubious about the mission, encourages his unit to talk about it. The team lands in a small French village where army forces currently battling against German forces. Miller questions to the nearest sergeant if Ryan is a member of his unit, but he is not. They send a runner across the battlefield to gather intelligence from the army unit on the other side of town. The runner is almost instantly cut down. They travel across town on side roads and come across a French family attempting to flee their bombed out home but caught in the gunfire. The father demands that the squad take his child to safety, Miller refuses, but Caparzo walks out from cover to do so without instructions. A sniper shoots him in the chest, and he falls, still alive. Caparzo is unable to be dragged to safety. So the team takes cover. Jackson soon recognizes the sniper's likely shooting position as the town's bell tower. He locates a nearby pile of rubble and utilizes it as cover to take out the sniper. While looking for another target among the team, the sniper finds Jackson too late and is shot through his own scope. Caparzo passes away, having bled to death. Miller looks down on his body and reminds his soldiers sternly that this is why they obey orders and don't take children. Wade finds a bloodstained letter written by Caparzo to his father from the body. The squad and the other soldiers take a seat inside a destroyed building in a different section of the village to rest. To locate their CO, a sergeant orders one of his men. A squad of German soldiers is visible inside the building when the sergeant sits down and topples a weak brick wall. There's a gunfight that results in both sides pointing their firearms at the other and demanding that the other put down their weapons. Unexpectedly. The standoff ends when the captain of the squad and the soldier tasked with finding him use machine guns to eliminate the Germans. Miller queries the captain about the presence of Private James F. Ryan in his team. Ryan is taken to Miller, who informs him that his siblings have passed away, after the captain affirms that he does. Miller responds that they were killed in combat as the man sobs and asks how they died. Miller is informed by Ryan, who is astonished, that his brothers are still in elementary school. After getting the man's full name. Miller discovers that he is James Frederick Ryan from Minnesota. Exasperated, Miller informs Ryan that he is certain his brothers are doing well. The squad finds out that Ryan might have gone to the Airborne's rallying place, which is close by, from another soldier from the 101st who is receiving medical attention for a leg wound. In a church, the squad rests for a few hours. Wade rewrites the letter Caparzo intended to deliver to his father, which was stained with blood. Miller and Horvath discuss how many soldiers Miller has lost while in charge. Miller acknowledges that fighting men's lives is necessary for the greater good. Speaking with the captain, Corporal Upham explains about the betting pool the soldiers are running in which they attempt to predict Miller's pre-war career. Miller and Upham reach a comical understanding through silence that Miller will provide Upham with a solution once the pool is large enough. The group arrives at a troop glider wreckage that serves as a rally point. There are dozens of injured soldiers at the rally site. The glider pilot, who is seated among the men, informs them that he has no idea where Private Ryan is. Steel plates were welded to the underside of the pilot's glider to protect a general he was delivering, making the glider too heavy for flight, and after being dragged, the glider crashed. The general was killed when the glider crashed. The group reflects on their attempts to safeguard just one guy. Miller receives a bag of dog tags from fallen soldiers from the pilot. Miller has his men go through them for Ryan. They do it callously when personnel from Army Airborne battalions pass by. Wade approaches and begins grabbing the tags, mumbling that his buddies are behaving strangely in front of the passing Airborne soldiers. Miller comes to the conclusion that Ryan isn't among them and, in a brief fit of desperation, begins questioning passing soldiers, asking whether any of them know Ryan. He gets luck with one man from Ryan's team who has lost his hearing due to a grenade blast. So he bellows his responses. Ryan has been assigned to a mixed unit that is protecting a bridge across the Murderay River in the nearby village of Rimmel, according to the guy. 
Miller concludes that the bridge is critical to both the army and the Germans because it allows them to drive their tank battalions across the sea. The group departs once more. They confirm that neither of the two dead GIs they find in a field are Ryan. A machine gun nest is visible to Miller and Horvath close to a partially wrecked radar dish. Miller decides to eliminate the German position even though Ryben believes that it would be simpler to stay away from the machine gun and go stealthily around it. This will save the next Allied unit from being ambushed and murdered. Despite the squad's opposition to the idea, he persists and assigns them their tasks. Upham is told to leave their equipment behind. Upham observes through one of Jackson's rifle sights as the squad launches an assault on the machine gun post. The men desperately call out for Upham to bring their equipment after the conflict. Wade is bleeding badly from multiple gunshot wounds to his lower chest as Upham arrives at them. Wade says he wants to go home as he passes away despite the men's desperate attempts to save him. After the squad captures one of the Germans alive, they rush to beat him as payback. Miller is unsure how to deal with the German POW and asks him to dig graves for Wade and the two GIs they saw in the field. When Upham complains that detainees should not be treated like slaves, Miller tells him to assist the German. Miller sits off to one side, crying, his right hand shaking again, as the German digs the graves. He gradually regains his composure and rejoins the squad. Except for Upham, who has moderately befriended the remaining German while digging the graves, Miller's crew wants to kill the remaining German. The German begs for his life, insisting on his love for America and shouting. When Miller intervenes, the men remain unmoved and ready to kill him with their weapons. He blindfolds the German and, much to the squad's surprise, lets him walk away, telling Upham to tell him to surrender to the next Allied force. Ryben, in particular, is outraged by Miller's compassion and threatens to quit, claiming that their mission has resulted in the deaths of two of their companions. Horvath instructs Ryben to form up and threatens to shoot him. The entire squad starts arguing, and Miller asks up and the sum of the pool on him. Miller tells that he teaches English composition in a tiny town in Pennsylvania. The men are stunned and stop arguing. Miller claims that the war has changed him and that he is unsure whether his wife would recognize him or whether he will be able to resume his previous life when he goes home. He believes that if finding and bringing Ryan back assures that he can return home sooner, then it is his responsibility to fulfill the assignment. Wade and the other GIs are buried together by the squad. Ramel is approached by the exhausted squad. They come across a German half-track while crossing a field. While the truck passes, Miller instructs everyone to take cover. The half-track is immediately bombarded with bazooka fire. Miller's squad is initially puzzled, unsure who is firing, then pushes in and kills Germans attempting to flee the ruined vehicle. A small group of US soldiers emerge from their posts in the field, identifying themselves as paratroopers from various airborne groups. Private James Ryan, one of them, identifies himself. Miller's squad discovers in the rubble of Rommel that Ryan and his companions are guarding one of the Murderay River's two remaining bridges. Their commanding officer had been assassinated only a few days prior. Miller informs Ryan that his three siblings have died and that he has been offered a return ticket. Ryan is horrified by the news of his family's death, but he refuses to leave, claiming that it is his duty to remain with his unit and defend the bridge until help arrives. Ryan claims his mum would sympathize with his need to stay at the bridge where the only brothers has left. There's no way for Miller to win Ryan over. Horvath and Miller decide to stay and assist the unit in defending the bridge after considering Ryan's rejection. The squad believes the Germans will launch a massive attack because the half-track they destroyed was a part of a German investigation to look into the forces guarding the bridge. Miller counts the few weapons and supplies they have left and lays out a strategy to ambush German tanks on Rommel's main street. Where debris from fallen buildings has created a narrow choke point that will force German troops and armor into a corner, allowing Miller's unit to flank the Germans. Ryben is supposed to lure the German unit into the bottleneck by riding out on a half-track motorbike. Miller recommends that they make do with homemade sticky bombs, which are socks packed with Composition B explosives and lubricated. One of the tanks will become a roadblock when they use the sticky explosives to blow off its treads. Upham is tasked with supplying ammo to Mellish and 101st paratrooper Parker, who are manning the two Browning machine gun positions. Parker positions himself as a lookout and provides sniper cover for Jackson while he positions himself on the church tower, reporting on the German approach. The men listen to Edith Piaf's 2S per 2 while they wait for the Germans to arrive. Upham translates, and his new friends appear more receptive of him, they give attention, even making jokes and sharing personal anecdotes. Miller is informed by Ryan that although he cannot see his brother's faces, he can recall them. 
as something they've all done together, Miller advises him to think of a context. Miller tells Ryan that he thinks of his wife pruning rose bushes whenever he wants to remember her. Ryan recounts how he and his brothers almost set fire to their farm's barn when they surreptitiously caught their older brother, Danny, trying to have sex in the hayloft with a local lady. When James realizes that the incident happened more than two years ago, before any of them had attended basic training, he stops laughing. Miller graciously declines Ryan's request to share his memories of his wife and the rose bushes, stating that they belong to him alone. The squad detects the arrival of the German column when they feel the ground start to rumble. There are two Panzer tanks, which are actually Martyr III self-propelled guns, and two Tiger I heavy tanks, according to Jackson's signal from the church tower. Plus, there are at least 50 German soldiers. Robin rides out to play the rabbit and entice the Germans into town after Miller gives the order for everyone to take their places. As one of the Tiger tanks moves along the main street, a soldier tries to attach a sticky bomb to it. Because he waits too long, the bomb explodes, killing him. Mines buried along the sides and men pursuing the tank kill the German forces. The Tiger comes to a stop after two men set the Comp B bombs on its wheels, destroying its tread. As they go to eliminate the tank's crew, a small German squad equipped with a 20mm flak gun opens fire on them, killing several more troops in a cruel manner. Throughout the fight, the squads led by Ryan and Miller exchange gunfire in positions multiple times. Several of the guys are killed, despite the fact that they catch the Germans off guard. When Jackson is found in his perch, a tank fire strikes him. Mellish and Corporal Henderson control a .30 caliber machine gun to stop the Germans from flanking. Following Henderson's death, a German soldier attacks Mellish and subdues him in hand-to-hand -hand combat before carefully plunging a bayonet into Mellish's chest. Corporal Upham is sitting on the stairs right outside the room, terrified and unable to move to save Mellish. Terrified Upham is not concerned as the German soldier murders Mellish and advances. Ryburn executes the operators of the 20mm cannon by flanking it. While he and another soldier are cornering each other, Sergeant Horvath sustains injuries. Each of them shoots the other with their weapon after hurling helmets at the other. Horvath gets injured and the German soldier here dies. When Miller tells them to cross the bridge to their Alamo position, where they will make their final stand, he snatches up him and retreats. Horvath launches more bazooka rockets at the 60-ton Tiger tank, but it is unstoppable and continues to follow. As he retreats, Horvath is shot in the chest and perishes shortly after. When a shell from the Tiger strikes the structure behind him, Miller is about to blow up the bridge when the detonator escapes his grasp. The German soldier he had freed at the radar station shoots him in the chest as he stumbles across the bridge to get it. Upham is hiding behind a mound of debris when he witnesses the shooting. Miller stumbles and is unable to get up. With a .45 pistol in his hand, he fires hopelessly at the Tiger tank that has started to cross the bridge. The tank bursts inconceivably quickly after a few bullets. Having destroyed the tank and many enemy targets, a small squadron of P-51 Mustang fighters abruptly appears in the sky. Ryben and Ryan rush to Miller's aid and call help. The opposition squad is unaware that Upham is still on the opposite side of the bridge. After revealing his identity, he kidnaps the whole squad. Upham is called by name by the man who shot Miller, recognizing him. Upham hesitates for a second before pulling the trigger, killing the man. As the soldier's body falls on the ground, Upham gives the other inmates a stern command to get out of there. Ryan tells the dying Miller that the Mustangs are tank busters. As Miller puts it, they are angels on our shoulders. Before he passes away, he calls Ryan over and says, earn this. Earn it. General George Marshall reads a letter to Ryan's mother in voiceover, telling her that her son is coming home. He quotes a sentence from Abraham Lincoln's letter about the cost of war. Ryan stands there, staring at Miller's body. The camera focuses on Ryan's young face as it transforms into Ryan in the present. He is standing at Captain Miller's grave. He tells Miller that he hopes he has lived up to Miller's wish and is deserving of everything Miller and his guys have done for him. He requests that his wife tell him that he has led a nice life and that he is a good man. The elder Ryan. Salutes Miller's tomb. An American flag, backlit by the afternoon sun, slowly flaps in the air.